Please take your Bible and turn with me to Hebrews chapter 13, and I'll be reading from verses 15 to 19. Hebrews chapter 13 and the middle portion. Through him, then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God, that is, the fruit of lips that give thanks to his name. And do not neglect doing good and sharing, for with such sacrifices God is pleased. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with grief, for this would be unprofitable for you. Pray for us. For we are sure that we have a good conscience, desiring to conduct ourselves honorably in all things. And I urge you all the more to do this, so that I may be restored to you the sooner. Thus endeth the reading of God's holy, inspired, and inerrant word. We come to the second last sermon which we are going to take out of Hebrews after having made our way patiently and methodically through these about 10 months or so that we have sojourned through the pages of Hebrews. We are coming to the very last word and how important the last word is that we will come to next week, but we're beginning that final wind down or wind up of Hebrews. And we're talking today about honorably always, honorably always. The desire is here that we as believers in Christ might conduct ourselves not in any way that we please, but that we might be honoring to God and that we might be honoring always in the way in which we act. We have received much rich wisdom as we've come, especially into the final couple chapters of Hebrews about how it is that believers should walk. We have said it many times through the course of this study, is that these people who originally received this book, they were under the danger of pulling away because of persecution, because of hardship, they were wondering whether they had missed the mark, whether they had, although first of all, with great exuberance, whether they had missed the intent of God and whether they had left their Judaistic roots a little bit too hastily, whether they had come to trust in Christ and whether that was perhaps a mistake. Maybe it was better for them that they simply go back to what they knew and what they had originally been raised in. And the, the reasoning or the, the rationale and the instruction all the way through is, please, please see who this is who you have come to follow. This is not simply a rabbi like the first century rabbi Gamaliel, a man of great distinction, in the Jewish community, and there were certainly many others. This is not simply a rabbi on that level. This is one who outstrips, who surpasses everyone in the Old Testament who is held forth as a most outstanding example of a godly leader, a godly life. Far better than Moses, and far better than Aaron, the first high priest, brother of Moses, far better than Joshua, who came and did what Moses was unable to do to bring the people into the land of promise. Jesus is the one who is better in every possible way, serving in a better tabernacle, working under better principles, a better covenant, having brought a better sacrifice, not the blood of animals, but bringing his own blood that we might know, cleansing, that we might know the atoning of our sin, that we might truly have the satisfaction of life in his name. 
better, far better than any of these others. Now, these, these people, they knew as others in the ancient world, not just within the Jewish world, but Greek, Roman, these people, they knew what sacrifice was. You go to the temples and to the religions of the ancient world. Sacrifice was very well known. But here, we're talking about a sacrifice of a better kind and a sacrifice that did not need to be repeated. Jesus Christ was the sacrifice that was made once and it was a fully finished and complete sacrifice that was made there on Calvary's cross. When Jesus said, it is finished, that was the final word. The sin question which had lingered for so long, it was dealt with, and the burden and the shame and the guilt, it was a thing of the past for all those who came and looked to Christ, and through looking, they would truly live. But those sacrifices, those were done in Christ. And when we look to him, we don't now come with a lamb or a ram or a turtle dove or a goat or anything else. We have the assurance that Christ is the final sacrifice. But now, having trusted in him, how do we live? We have just studied this. Hebrews chapter 12 and chapter 13. And if you missed that, go back, read and soak. This is how that we are to live and the confidence that we have in him. But lest we think, well, no more sacrifices for us. There are here in the portion which I just read, Hebrews chapter 13, verses 15 and 16, there are two sacrifices which are mentioned. They are not bloody or they are not animal sacrifices, but they are yet sacrifices which are for us and they carry forward. They are sacrifices unlike the sacrifice on Christ, of Christ on Calvary. They are sacrifices which are to be repeated and which are to be a constant part of the believer's life. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 15, we first of all read, through him, through him. How I wish that I could impress and indelibly stamp upon your thoughts and upon your soul that all that we have, we have through him. We began this service by reading out of Ephesians chapter 1 and verses 3 and 4, and there, through Christ, in Christ, we have great riches beyond our wildest imagination and anticipation. Through him, all that we have, we have entered into because of what he has done for us, and now he is the one who takes us by the hand when we were dead in our trespasses and sins. And he is the one who leads us to glory. He is the one who dresses us in robes of righteousness, having cleansed us with his own blood. Through him we have access into the very presence of God. It is all and completely through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ that we enter in. Through him, then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. Praise is to be a sacrifice that we made. It is to be as in the temple of old, where there was incense that would rise up, and it was to be a sweet savor in the, in the presence of God. Here, we as believers in Christ, having entered into such riches and having been partakers of that enormous, inestimable wealth, we are to offer up a sacrifice of praise without ceasing 
The Apostle Paul said that we are to pray without ceasing. Here also, the offering of praise to God and the giving of thanks is something that is just to emanate from us in an unceasing manner. It is to continue to flow like a river, summer or winter, day or night. It is to flow from us. Through him, then, let us offer up continually a sacrifice of praise to God, that is, the fruit of lips that give thanks to his name. A thankless Christian is one who is an anomaly in the kingdom of God. It just doesn't fit that there would be It's like gas and water. They don't mix in a good way. And so here we have a thankless believer. We are here reading, it ought not to be, dear brothers and sisters. These things ought not to be. We ought to emanate. We ought to flow with thanksgiving for what God has done for us. And that not ought, to, ought not just to be within us, but it ought to come out of us as well. It shouldn't be just something that warms our own heart and that we're thankful in our thoughts and in our minds, but it's something that should come forth that others might pay attention, that we are indeed thankful people because they hear it, because They are aware of what's coming out of us. Verse 16 says, this is another sacrifice, and do not neglect doing good and sharing. For with with such sacrifices, God is pleased. There is the sacrifice of praise And that sometimes is a difficult sacrifice when there are times of testing. These people here in Hebrews, they had known trials and testings. They had known difficulties where they had lost so much. But yet they are called to offer up continually that sacrifice of praise, even in the midst of difficulty and hardship. Now here is another sacrifice that we are not to neglect doing good and sharing with others. The first century Christians were very notable. We go to the earliest chapters of the book of Acts and we see how that the brothers and sisters, they realized that the things that they had entered into were of such precious character that the things of this world suddenly meant infinitely less to them than they did before. And it was just natural that they were sharing with one another, caring for one another, meeting one another's needs. Here, once again, the, in, the impetus or the encouragement is that here is another sacrifice that is to be a part of our lives. Let us do this also. Let us not neglect doing good and sharing. We read that Jesus, he went about doing good to people wherever they were found. Not simply to Jews, but he was across the borders of Israel in Syrophoenicia, healing little girl of that widow woman. And Jesus doing good wherever he went, touching the lepers who Other people, they skirted wide around them, caring for those who no one cared for, teaching people, not with with his hand out and passing the offering plate constantly, he was just caring for people, sharing the love of God, ministering to them out of the depth of that deep well of God's riches. Here, this is for us as well doing good and not neglecting to share. And the word is added, for with this kind of sacrifice, God is pleased. God is pleased. And that, for the believer, 
is exactly the center of the target. That God would look with, with pleasure upon our lives. That he would look down and say, those people, I so delight in them. I rejoice in how that they are living. They are living their lives honorably and they are pleasing in my sight. Verse 17, we shift gears here a little bit, but not really. Once again, we are dealing with how is it that we as believers live before a watching world and in company with others in the body of Christ, how is it that we live so that God is honored, so that God is pleased, and so that we distinguish ourselves as being different than the world. Verse 17, we read, Obey your leaders. Obey your leaders and submit to them. Why? Why should I do that? Because if I don't, that I'll get clobbered? Because they might raise my taxes? or but Why? Why should I do such a thing? I don't think that I agree with them all of the time. Here we're especially dealing with those within the body of Christ. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they keep watch over your souls. We're talking about church leaders. They keep watch over your souls as those who will give account. It is plainly stated in the New Testament how that church leadership is a heavy responsibility not to be taken by someone lightly, not to be self-appointed, but to take this with a right and proper gravity. It is something that is of very heavy weight because one day God will judge and especially those who have been preachers and teachers. Now here, this is this, this word at this time at least, there are other points where, where teachers and preachers uh, have a very severe rebuke given to them, but here we have the congregation who is addressed, obey your leaders and submit to them because of the work that these leaders have been given. They have a heavy task Pray for them, encourage them, build them up, listen to them, for they are concerned for your well-being. And the word in the second half of verse 17 is, let them do this, let them do their work with joy and not with grief. How often leadership is indeed a grief. Some people foolishly clamor to be in the leader's boots or to be in the leader's chair, and only when they get to that place do they realize that it is not at all what they anticipated it would be, but that it is a very severe weight. So the word here is to the congregation, let them, the leaders, do their work with joy because you are attending to what they are saying. The sermons that are sent forth or the encouragement or the rebuke or the challenge, give full weight to that and that will be a joy to the leadership when they see that the people of God are laying hold of the word of God and that they are moving forward into growth. Let them do this with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. There is no profit, there is no benefit when leadership just utters words and those words are not grabbed a hold of and captured and they are not a benefit. They don't sink down into the soul and into the being of those who are believers in Christ. That would be unprofitable. If people were just to shirk it off and just to say, I'll do whatever I want to do. Verse 18 then says, pray for us. 
We've just had leadership speak to the congregation, but now that leadership is realizing we need you, the congregation, the readership, those who are receiving this letter, we need you to be praying for us. The Apostle Paul also was one who said, pray for us. We need to have you as our support in prayer before the throne of God. Here we have it. Pray for us. Pray for us. There is a humility that is shown. There is an urgency. There is an honoring of prayer. Pray for us. For we are sure that we have a good conscience desiring to conduct ourselves honorably in all things. And the way in which we do that, in which we, the way in which we are honorable before the Lord in all things is that we commit ourselves to prayer and that we ask others to join us in that great task. And I urge you all the more to do this so that I may be restored to you the sooner. And there we will conclude for today. Through him, through him, I come back to the beginning of Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 15. How I would want you to see all that we have received in Christ Jesus. Jesus Christ left the glories of heaven. Why? Was it that he was bored? Oh, what a silly idea. Was it that he wanted to see something different? He had been here on creation's morning. All things were created through him, and without him was not anything made that has been made. Jesus knew every molecule. He knew every detail of this world. He did not come to this world because he wanted to check it out. Jesus Christ came to this world in order that those who were lost, that those who were dead in their trespasses and sins might be found and that they might live. Jesus Christ came that the prodigals might come home. Jesus Christ came from heaven's glories to this world. He left the highest throne in order to be humbled in the meanest way, in order that we who have been humbled by sin, who have been ground into the dirt that we might be able to lift our eyes and lift our heads and realize that we have been loved with an everlasting love and that we might be raised up to glory, that we might be cleansed, that we might be renewed, that we might be redeemed, that we might be adopted into the family of God. Jesus Christ came for these very reasons that you and that I might know life abundant and everlasting in Jesus Christ. But if we leave Jesus out, and that was the danger that was taking place here among these brothers and sisters so long ago, there was the danger that they would seek to be pleasing before the Lord, not through Christ, but through some other way. And the writer here is saying, you're never going to make it. That's not going to work. Through him, through Jesus Christ, and through him alone, we are able to offer up words of praise. We are able to offer up hymns and songs and psalms of praise. And we are able to do good and to share with others. Otherwise, we're consumed with ourselves because of the aching need of our own hearts. But when we turn full face to Christ, as we read at the beginning of Hebrews chapter 12, fixing our eyes upon him, 
shutting out all of the other things, setting aside those things which entangle and trip us up, those things which weigh us down, and pressing ahead with Jesus Christ and with him alone, that is by far the best thing that we could possibly do. Please hear this. Through him, through him, through Jesus Christ, and through him alone, we have salvation, full and free. I would encourage you to lay hold of this today, that Jesus Christ has come that you might know his salvation. You can know a lot of things in this world, but if you don't know Jesus Christ, you do not know salvation. You can know sin, that's for sure, but you'll never know the forgiveness of sins. You can know defilement, but you will never know what it is to walk straight and tall and to not have those very sins weigh heavy upon your conscience and your soul. You can come into the very presence of a holy God because Jesus Christ has cleansed you. Without Jesus, that is absolutely not possible. You can call upon angels and you can pray to saints and you can do all of the things that these, this world's religions have to say to you, but unless you come through the door, which is Jesus Christ, all is in vain and all is for no purpose. Would you bow with me in prayer, please? Lord, I give you thanks and praise for what we have through Jesus Christ, through our Lord, our Savior, our Master, our Redeemer and soon coming King. I pray for every man and every woman who hears my voice that they would come to bow before you realizing that in Christ there are riches untold. There is delights beyond any delight of this world. So Lord, work in power, I pray and draw men and women to yourself, and may they come to the cross, calling upon your name, bowing before you, turning in repentance, and looking for your life, true and abundant. Hear us, O God, and grant that salvation. Grant that new life, that miracle of new birth. I pray that it would happen this very moment, and may joy fill the heart. May joy overflowing fill the heart, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen.